The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The land, air, and water is precious for everyone who lives on Turtle Island, the name many indigenous people call North America. And preserving them requires a coordinated effort. Tonight, on this Indigenous People's Day, we reflect on how working together on conservation issues could also help further reconciliation. Then we'll learn something about how First Nations in this province govern themselves and what issues are top of mind. It's Tuesday, June 21st, and that's next on The Agenda. Indigenous people were stewards of this land long before the founding of Canada or Ontario. And amid a growing recognition that the future for all of us on this land requires meaningful collaboration, initiatives for land conservation might also be mapping pathways of reconciliation. With us now to find out more, let's welcome in Victoria, British Columbia, Bob Joseph, President of Indigenous Corporate Training, Inc., in Treaty 6, Rocky Mountain House, Alberta, Amy Christensen, Indigenous Fire Specialist at Parks Canada and co-host of the Good Fire podcast. In the West End of the provincial capital, Faisal Mula, Associate Professor at the University of Guelph and Research Lead for Biocultural Indicators and Outcomes Research Stream for the Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. And here in our studio, J.P. Gladue, principal at Mokwate Limited, a consultancy bringing indigenous communities and the business sector together. And we are delighted to welcome all of you, uh, in some cases back to our program, in some cases for the first time to our program. It's great to see you all. And Amy, I'll just arbitrarily, if I can, start with you and maybe just have you tell us uh, a little bit more about what it is that your group does. So, um, yeah, I, so I'm Amy. I'm from uh, Treaty 8 territory, actually, my family. So I'm a Métis woman. I live right now in Treaty 6. And I work with Parks Canada as an Indigenous fire specialist. So um, before uh, colonization of Canada, Indigenous people used fire on the landscape, basically to achieve different cultural objectives, but also to reduce their wildfire risk. And so right now, um, I'm working with Parks Canada to develop relationships with nations to be able to bring that practice back. And what is the Good Fire podcast all about? Yeah, so in the Good Fire podcast, we talk with Indigenous fire specialists from around the world about how they're using fire on the land, what challenges they have with putting fire back. Um, and yeah, it's just a really great opportunity to just have some open and honest chats with some of the leading um, Indigenous fire keepers. Gotcha. Faisal, how about to you? Uh, maybe you could help us understand a little more about conservation through reconciliation and Canada's current efforts to conserve more natural spaces. How are you involved in that? Sure, thanks. Um, well, I'm a professor at the University of Guelph. I also spent about 20 years in Canada's environmental movement. I was the former director general for the Davis Suzuki Foundation. Uh, the work of my colleagues, this is an Indigenous-led uh, pan-national initiative in support of Indigenous-led conservation of traditional lands and waters and the resurgence of Indigenous conservation governance across the country. And we're actually working internationally as well. Now, here's a technical term. Indigenous protected and conserved areas. What are those? Yeah, so Indigenous protected and conserved areas, uh, you know, in many ways, I see this as a complementary form of governance to the sort of parks and protected areas that most Canadians probably have some familiarity with, or perhaps are, are even visiting this summer going camping or hiking or fishing or, or such. What makes Indigenous protected and conserved areas different is that these are areas that are established by Indigenous peoples themselves under their own diversity of governance systems. And and they're not just focused around the protection of the habitat for plants and animals, but also places where Indigenous peoples can continue to exercise their millennia-long relationship with nature. And, you know, my colleague, Dr. Amy there, gave an example of the cultural use of fire. That's a biocultural practice that Indigenous peoples have used for thousands of years for the betterment of biodiversity in Canada and across the planet. Gotcha. Bob, I know that there are many Canadians now who are more open to the message of reconciliation than perhaps at any other time in our long history together, but uh, they may not understand how land conservation and protection plays into that. Could you help us understand that? 
Yeah, I think uh, when we think about uh, land conservation and protection, we have uh, a lot of uh, contributions that we can make when it comes to uh, that conversation. Um, a lot of the work that I do um, focuses around uh, development, industrial development, crown land development, those kinds of things, and trying to trying to uh, strike that balance of uh, conservation and protection and helping people understand the different objectives that people may have when they come to those conversations, right? When we think about, um, say, a, a group like the Nature Conservancy Canada and or Bucks Unlimited or, you know, one of those types of organizations and Indigenous peoples, they, they would share many common interests, but maybe for slightly different reasons. And so that's what I try to help people understand. They would, you know, they'd want to conserve to maybe continue exercising their rights to fish or hunt or, you know, gather medicinal plants. Those kinds of things, I think, would be important for people to understand, and that's what I try to do. Well, let me explore whether or not you have common interests here with JP, because JP, of course, has been on our program in the past as well, talking about a more business-like approach and uh, the development of natural resources that we have here. And is there anything inconsistent about what you are about and what the others uh, here are about? No, I think we're all walking a very similar line in that we're trying to find um, ways to balance conservation, put Indigenous people in the front or co-drivers in some cases to make sure that our knowledge systems are brought to the forefront so we can have a balanced approach. It, it shouldn't be an either or. We have to balance economy, responsible, sustainable development uh, along with uh, conservation initiatives. I'm very familiar with Bob, a longtime friend, and I'm getting to know Amy and I'm really excited. I'm a forester by tra training, Amy, and I love to, to love to know more about what you're doing and Faisal I mean it is absolutely important that we bring all these knowledge systems together it's it's a shame that it's taken this long for Canada and provinces to recognize that we've got thousands of years of traditional knowledge that is in the wings waiting to be applied to the way that we actually manage our, our lands and using that knowledge system is is paramount I'm gonna do a little follow-up with you here because obviously there will be some who think that land conservation is inconsistent with resource development and therefore there's a collision course as opposed to a collaboration there. Mm. Not the case? Not the case. Um, there are certainly um, sections that are going to be appropriate for resource development, um, and there are areas that are going to be really important for conservation, and I, I'll share a personal story with um, how we can actually achieve those. Please. Yeah, well, you know, being, you know, my daughter loves, she loves to hunt and fish, and these aren't my typical hunting clothes, but, you know, if I had a little camel on here, it is green, I might be able to sneak up on a moose, but I am a very much a big user of the land, I hunt and fish, but my daughter comes to the land with me, we go to the water, the creek, we live on Lake, uh, Lake Nipigan, which is the biggest lake in Ontario, surrounded by the Ontario borders, I, I was just there yesterday fishing, drinking the water right out of the lake, and it's totally protected, then I can go down the reserve road, go to our sawmill that our community owns and we're developing uh, lumber for our community and for the region to use, um, for instance, in mining. Then we go across the Trans-Canada uh, Highway, then we go across the Trans-Canada Pipeline, which provides natural gas, uh, as well as you know my, one of my grandfathers helped build that. Then we go to areas which are being explored for lithium mining. We hope to have uh, lithium mines in the next couple, two to three years, which is going to be a, a really important mineral and battery production and green transition. And then we go down the road a little bit further, and there's a hydro development, which my uncle uh, runs for on the behalf of three First Nations and our partner with Axor. Mm -hmm. So we've got it all, and and it's not it's not an accident. Um, that uh, we've got good economy and conservation. I can practice my land traditions with my daughter and pass those on. We, we can actually have it all. Bob, are you buying that cohabitation agreement we just uh, heard more about? Um, yeah, I think I think um, really hit the nail on the head, you know, finding that sweet spot of uh, sustainability and, you know, protected areas and being able to uh, exercise Section 35 rights. It's definitely... Um, what people are looking for, I think, you know, one of the um, one of the messages we've always heard from Indigenous communities is, look, we're, we're not get, we're not against development, but it can't be development at all costs. We've got to try and find a way to uh, incorporate, you know, um, our our land values and um, you know water resources. And where I come from, I, I'm a little bit different here, out on the uh, west coast in Victoria where I'm uh, talking to you from today, we're uh, fish people. So we worry a lot about fish and um, 
making sure that that's uh, an available resource for people that and, and it is impacted by uh, forestry and climate change and a whole bunch of uh, other things that can really uh, impact but I do think it is something that we have to strive to do um, you know uh, when we think about total conservation one of the one of the challenges is it, it'll make it hard for the nations to move away from the Indian Act if they're not self-sufficient so I think what uh, JP was talking about just makes so much sense. Faisal anything inconsistent about what JP has just described and what you're about? No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree at all. I think the key thing here is it has to be Indigenous-led. And, you know, there are examples of where Indigenous protected and conserved areas are being established by Indigenous nations in response to the threat of industrial development. For example, Gracineros First Nation, which I know the, your program has looked at, they have declared essentially their entire traditional territory as an Indigenous protected and sovereignty area, largely in response to the threat of mining and logging within the traditional territory that has the potential to exacerbate a very tragic situation, which is mercury poisoning of the watershed. In that case, what the, the nation has said really clearly is they're not opposed to industrial development within the territory, but they want to bring some certainty around how that development is gonna proceed. And they see indigenous protected and conserved areas as one manner of exerting their governance and their sovereignty in response to the sorts of activities that they do not want to happen. The same thing's happening in other First Nations as well. The Tolopia First Nation, for example, established an Indigenous protected and conserved area uh, in on the west coast of uh, uh, British Columbia, uh, close to Tofino, in response to the threat of clear-cut logging. Uh, the Chilcotin people have done the same. They established uh, Dasico. Uh, indigenous protected and conserved areas. So I think the key thing here is it has to be indigenous led. And when we say indigenous led, it's not just about respecting and upholding the rights of indigenous peoples to be decision makers over their own traditional territories. It's also about integrating the knowledge systems that JP talked about, the very sophisticated understanding that indigenous peoples have over their territories, which in many cases actually goes well beyond the understanding that I, as a Western trained scientist, have of how nature is actually operating uh, within vast areas of, of the country. Amy, could I get you to follow up on that in this regard? Do you think there's anything controversial about the indigenous led nature of this exercise here? In other words, it, 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 is the rest of Canada, do they understand that's what's required here? Yeah, you know, I think that many Canadians still have that kind of older idea of conservation where it's, you know, keeping wilderness and removing people from areas. So, um, you know, where the establishment of parks and other things where people were kind of cleared out to protect wilderness. But I think what we're talking about here with Indigenous-led conservation is the recognizing that Indigenous peoples and peoples in general are an important part of the landscape. Those are our relations, our relatives, and that we can't really be excluded from them. So it's trying to see how we can sustainably all live together. And I think the point that JP made about, you know, development, I think that Indigenous people are highly adaptable and have never aren't against development, but it just needs to be done in the right way, in the right places. Um, so, for example, not a ceremonial site or archaeologic site or something like that. Well, okay, let me just uh, make sure I understand you here, because there, there are some Indigenous people, and we've seen them on the news, who are opposed to a great deal of the resource development and or economic development that I think some people here on this program tonight would champion and be in favor of. So what do you do about that? Yeah, you know, I can, I, I don't, you know, know a ton about some of those situations, but what I've heard and read and listened to folks talk about it is that mostly they're frustrated frustrated with the lack of um, consultation or the lack of engagement about some of the development that's gone in. So where they feel like their voices aren't being heard at all. And I think that that really creates a lot of frustration um, instead of, you know, maintaining good relationships uh, between industry and Indigenous people and government. Lots of times I think that we feel like our voices aren't being included in the discussion. No, I take your point there. JP, maybe you could build on that in as much as, you know, I mean, we heard Doug Ford say this a few years ago, that if that if he didn't get everybody on side to build up the ring of fire, he's going to get up there on the bulldozer himself and start to you know, <laughs> make stuff happen, which may not have been the best thing to say. But but I think his point was one indigenous group that would be opposed to the 
positive exploitation of the resources there should not allow the whole thing not to happen. I presume you're on side with that. Uh, I, I largely am. Uh, I used to actually sit on the board in Oran, the Ring of Fire, right. and I'm um, so very familiar with the project and the communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, Canada needs to understand we're not a monolith. Um, just like any community, 20% of our community members are going to oppose, 20% are going to be rah, 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 and this, you know, the 60% say how good my math is there, it all ended up 100, <laughs> uh, are going to be on the fence and need to be educated in before they make an informed decision. And that's really the big part of this conversation is having inf information. Um, and I guess one of the things that starts to um, make me feel a little unnerved is when we see these massive protests and you'll see a small portion, you'll see some Indigenous people in there, but then you'll see non-Indigenous people speaking for us, which really grates on my nerves because we have the, the, the power and the knowledge to speak for ourselves. And when they start holding signs, non-Indigenous people, free prior informed consent, they, and yes, that is an important part of our conversation and you have to have the informed um, body to make informed decisions. Um, but I would also ask them, well, what, what gave you the right to speak for us to say no to our opportunities? And have you ever been to one of our Indigenous communities that have been living in poverty for a long time? And sometimes resource development is the only opportunity for our communities out of the distinct poverty that often defines our communities. Well, uh, okay, so let me, how do I want to put this? There are some well-meaning environmental yes, sir. people, <laughs> admittedly, probably in downtown Toronto, who've never been to places where you live, and they want to be helpful, they want to be allies, but they've just heard you say, we don't need you speaking for us. So we, what should they do? We want allies. We want them at the table to have conversations. I'd love to spend more time with Faisal to understand. I do work with uh, or environmental organizations. In fact, I chair the Boreal Leadership Champions, which is led by you know, the Indigenous Leadership Initiative. You know, my good friend Valerie Courtois, who leads the Land the, the Guardians program. We've got a, a table set up for you know unlikely bedfellows, oil, gas, mining, forestry, finance, mm -hmm. tourism, all Indigenous leadership. It's everything that we're talking about here on the camera. But let's have these conversations together so that you don't go running off trying to speak for us without understanding us. And we also want to make sure that we understand the best Western science at the same time that Faisal leads. But let's combine our resources, let's combine our knowledge systems and make decisions together. Our communities are absolutely tired of all these decisions happening without us at the table. We're an inviting people, come up to our communities and understand. You mentioned a group there and I'm going to ask Amy to explain the Guardians. Uh, what, who are the Indigenous Guardians and what do they do? Yeah, so um, I serve on an advisory group for the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, and that's where they want to um, basically establish fire guardians. So where um, people are employed basically by their nation to work on fire management in their territory. So that includes um, not only looking at you know, fire suppression, so putting out fires, but also in reducing wildfire risk, in monitoring cultural keystone species, in working with their community and educating youth about Indigenous knowledge. So as Faisal mentioned before, it's really about putting Indigenous people in charge of monitoring in their territories. All right, Bob, maybe you could follow up on that by answering, if there are more Indigenous-led initiatives, how does that affect their communities? Well, I think that they that will return them and really reconnect them back with their communities. Remember, the Indian Act really uh, confined them, made them stick to uh, to the reserves. Um, but I, I do know when I think about uh, think about uh, Treaty Eight territory, for example, you know, there's been a recent decision, the Blueberry decision, which started to um, really address an issue that was important around development, which was cumulative impacts. And I think uh, cumulative impacts, it, you know, really was an expression from the, uh, the blueberry to say, hey, we don't just want to talk about one drill site. We want to talk about a whole bunch of drill sites and roads and, and everything that's impacting our community. So I think, you know, there are some great insights from that, just when we think about the people and communities, and I think there's going to be some uh, very strong legal support coming out of, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada and governments will have to really start to pay attention to um, the cumulative impacts, which, you know, largely when we think about uh, Ontario, they're maybe thinking about their treaty rates and how they're impacted by all of the development. And just uh, give uh, us give us a titch of the background there. That Treaty 8 is where and the Blueberry decision is what? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, Treaty 8, pardon me, <laughs> British Columbia, I forget, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased, that's where I'm, I'm coming from here today. So northeastern British Columbia, it, uh, Treaty 8 covers about 27% of the province, and um, and the uh, Blueberry First Nation is uh, a nation that brought forward this court case really around consultation, as Amy and, and JP mentioned, which is an important piece of the conversation. They really um, were unhappy with being consulted about you know sort of one project versus all of the you know for example drill sites in their territory and what they were saying is we don't just want to talk to you about the one drill site that's just it's not a big enough world view that they're trying to bring to the conversation and um, and so they went to uh, the Supreme Court of Canada and the Supreme Court of Canada said yes we need to really start to take into account the cumulative impacts which I think puts even more emphasis on, you know, protection and uh, environmental issues will become even more important in the conversations, that, especially the ones that are led by uh, consultation. Understood. Faisal, what would you say are the biggest obstacles to you being able to do what you do more of and better? Yeah, so a lot of this has to do with the policy framework in which Indigenous peoples are bringing for these incredibly ambitious um, plans for conserving vast, vast regions of the country. I, I, I think it's really important for Canadians to understand that, you know, notwithstanding being a vast country of mountains and ice and, and old growth forests, that what's sometimes refer people refer to as wilderness is is a really um, incorrect understanding of of the country. Um, you know, places like the far north of Canada, the boreal, the Arctic, uh, the temperate rainforests of the BC coast, these are not unpeopled places. These continue to be the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples and have been under their stewardship for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, Western science is only now beginning to understand that many of the conservation values that we're trying to protect, like the habitat of caribou and, and old growth forests and such, are directly an outcome of Indigenous-led stewardship. The, the traditional use of fire, for example, that Amy has mentioned. The problem is, is that Canada's policy and laws around the establishment of Indigenous protected and conserved areas have not really caught up with this resurgence in Indigenous conservation leadership. There really is no legislation in Canada that Indigenous peoples can avail themselves to establish an IPCA within their traditional territories. Now, things are moving really, really fast. And in fact, this morning, something really big happened, which was an announcement that the final negotiations of the, a global biodiversity treaty are going to be moved from Kunming, China to Montreal, Canada at the end of December. So this is when all of the countries of the world that are signatories to an international convention on biodiversity are going to sign an international treaty that is essentially going to set the global agenda for the conservation of nature for the next you know, several decades. This is an excellent opportunity uh, for the country to really emphasize and amplify the leadership of Indigenous peoples when it comes to the conservation of traditional territories. What do you need from the federal government then to, to give greater effect to what you've just talked about? Well, the federal government has actually done something very good. I'm usually a very cr big critic of government policy as a, as a professor of environmental policy. But one of the things that Canada has done is, the first thing is the Prime Minister made an announcement several, uh, actually a year ago, that Canada is going to try to protect 30% of the country by 2030. This is probably going to be the target that is going to be signed at the uh, COP15, which is this big international gathering of nations that's going to happen in Montreal from December 5th to December 17th of 2022. Uh, the one thing the federal government has said really clearly is that Canada's ability to reach these really ambitious targets around conservation will not happen without Indigenous peoples. In other words, I suspect that all of the new parks and protected areas that we see being established from now on are going to be Indigenous-led. They're going to be Indigenous-protected and conserved areas, and they're going to happen all across the country, not just in the far north, but even in urban areas. I mean, the Canadian government is on track to establishing 10 new urban federal parks. All of those parks are going to be established with the Indigenous peoples who have called these areas uh, their traditional territories for thousands of years be before our cities and suburbs arose across the country, including where I am here 
in Toronto, which is the, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and uh, Anishinaabe and Mississauga's peoples. JP, I wonder whether you think we have reached uh, a point in time in the history of Canada and its relationship with Indigenous peoples to the point where there is mutual respect, there is an understanding about how to go forward and make progress, and we're unlikely to backpedal on that. We are, we are now in a new way of doing things. Do you think we're there? We have hit a tipping point, 100%. Um, I don't think, it doesn't matter what government gets in next time, uh, there's not going to be any backpedaling because the precedents are now being set. We've got, I mean, you talked to, to Bob about this and, you know, all the legal precedents, um, everything that's been set in front of us now is, is a path. And, you know, now with the United Nations Declara Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, Canada adopting that, BC's already ahead of the, ahead of the curve on that. Those, those pieces of legislation, the way that we're going to relate together, it's, it's a new path. There are certainly things that we need to do to strengthen the path together, um, like capitalization, um, more support for Indigenous capacity to participate at tables, making sure that our people are on par with the rest of other Canadians. I mean, we've got quite a diverse spectrum of capacity from the very poor to some of the most successful people in the country. Um, and there's still a, a major gap there that needs to be filled. But I think, you know, I'm excited about the future. I've got an 18 year old daughter who, like I said, loves to come up and hunt and fish, but she's moving to Montreal soon for school. And uh, I'm excited for her future. Is she going to cut your hair going forward? I, I, she, I hope so. I, she, she did it during the pandemic and uh, she did not a bad job, but I'm looking forward to a little more training. <laughs> She going to school for that? She is. Good for you. Okay. Uh, Amy, can I get you to follow up on that? Do you think we're... Actually, you know what? This Martin Luther King quote just popped into my head, so let me put that to you, which is that es essentially, you know, history's arc bends towards justice, um, but not always uninterrupted, I think is the line we should put in brackets after that. Are you convinced that, that we're headed in the right direction without interruption? Yeah, so I think that there probably will be interruptions, unfortunately, but I think like the other panelists had said, with some of the legal precedents that are being set, like the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, as well, the TRC calls for, you know, continuance of culture, and we can't have culture without having uh, healthy lands to base our culture on. So I do see a lot of steps forward and momentum um, in this way, and I think the um, general Canadian public as well is becoming much more educated about some of these issues like residential schools, about um, conservation and other things. So I think that that helps um, move momentum in our favour. And there's lots of Western studies coming out too that are showing, you know, the importance of Indigenous people in promoting biodiversity, that we have 80% of the world's biodiversity under our management. So I think that, you know, the more and more things that come out like that, it's just going to strengthen public resolve in our favor. Gotcha. I should do one last fact check in our last 30 seconds here. JP, did I hear you say earlier that Lake Nipigon is the biggest Great Lake in the province? It's the biggest not, lake. Not Great Lake, sorry. Biggest lake. Well, it's sometimes referred to the Sixth Great Lake. Yeah. Uh, it is the biggest lake in Ontario when you think about being surrounded by the Ontario borders. Bigger than Superior. No, the, surrounded by the Ontario borders. Surrounded by the so Ontario borders. Yeah, it's massive. Okay. And like I said, like I just yesterday, I was fishing it and drinking the water right out of the lake, and the fishing's incredible. Gotcha. You can come okay. up fishing anytime. Uh, you know, invite me. I'd come. I'd love to. <laughs> Never been there. Love to do it. Um, Mr. Director, that's what I needed. A sh four shot of everybody. Can I thank JP and Faisal and Bob and Amy for coming onto our program tonight. We hope this has been a meaningful day for all of you, and we look forward to it. Uh, welcoming you on our program once again at future times. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Learning is a core tenet of reconciliation. So to that end, with us now to find out more about how Indigenous communities are governed, we welcome in Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory near Belleville, Ontario, Chief Donald Miracle of the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte. Just south of Peterborough, near Rice Lake, Chief Lori Carr of Hiawatha First Nation, which is part of Treaty 20 and Williams Treaties lands. And just on the south side of Rice Lake, Chief Dave Mowat of Alderville First Nation, home of the Mississauga Anishinaabeg, 
And here in our studio, Chief R. Stacy LaForme of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And we are delighted to have all four of you chiefs with us today on this National Indigenous Peoples Day. I thought what we'd do off the top is just get to know all of you a little bit better and find out, for example, Chief Carr, why don't you start us off here? Where specifically is Hiawatha First Nation? Well, Ane, Steve, miigwech for having me. Hiawatha First Nation is located on the North Shore of Rice Lake, approximately 30 kilometers southeast of Peterborough. And we have a citizenship of 980 people. And our community makes up approximately 2,100 acres. Gotcha. And what do you see as your prime responsibility as the chief? There are many prime responsibilities, Steve. Uh, uh, I think for us, a lot of it is housing, infrastructure, and um, citizenship and, and coming to um, who is our community, who, who belongs to our community. It's, it's an important issue within, uh, with our citizens and with the extended family of our citizens. Understood. All right, Chief Miracle, same question. What did you tell us specifically whereabouts your First Nation is? Our First Nation is located east of Belleville, between Belleville and Kingston, Ontario, along the north shore of the Bay of Quinte. And your population is how many? We have over 10,000 members. Uh, 2,200 members live on the reserve. There's about another four or 500 non-native spouses that also live here and some children that do not have status. Okay, and uh, I guess uh, Chief Carr said her mission was multitudinous. Maybe you could take a shot at that one as well. We are responsible for the well-being of our community members, both on and off reserve. Um, we have to look after their needs for uh, for housing, for uh, on reserve for housing, for for uh, the provision of water, for good roads, for education at all levels, for both at the public school level. This uh, the, we have uh, tuition agreements with the um, Hastings County School Board, as well as we fund post secondary education. We provide um, uh, health related services. Uh, uh, to the community as well as educational services with uh, we hire uh, teachers and uh, teachers aides and um, music instructors uh, secretaries we have bus drivers that look after our education program and we have uh, nurses and other professionals that provide health care to our community um, we have senior senior programming um, and then we also have land claims and uh, government relations and uh, and uh, relations with uh, neighboring governments. So it is a pretty Which endless list, I can, I can tell. Uh, let me ask you one last thing, and that is uh, your headdress. Tell us about the significance of the headdress you're wearing. Today I'm wearing uh, a, a headdress. It's a traditional Mohawk headdress with three feathers. Uh, for the, the Mohawks had three feathers. This is the traditional chief's headdress. And I'm wearing it today because to celebrate the, uh, the Aboriginal day that's, that's commemorated in Canada. Very good. Understood. Chief LaForme, Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, you want to tell us specifically where that is? Not too far from here. Well, Mississaugas of the Credit Reserve is located, uh, I tell people, halfway between Hamilton and Port Dover. All right, but we, we have um, 3.9 million acres of treaty lands throughout the territories in southern Ontario, so it's vast. So that's why I'm always around. You're always around. I'm always around. How about your population? How many people? Uh, we have um, 2,600 Mississaugas of the credit. Uh, we have roughly 10,000 in the Mississauga Nation, uh, which the Chief Carr and Chief Mullet are, are a part of. Well, we have slightly less than 10,000 than that, but, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I hear we're going to have a cold winter, so... You're the one with the sense of humor today, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell that about you already. How about your mission? What do you say is the top part? Well, you know, both the Chiefs that spoke before me listed a multitude of things, and we all deal with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it's um, the main focus is uh, strategic planning in all those areas. Planning uh, for 100 and 150 years with the community and the nation itself and seeing where they want to go, looking at how we get there and breaking it down in manageable chunks. Gotcha. Chief Mowat, Alderville First Nation is where? Thanks, Steve. Alderville First Nation is located uh, within uh, uh, Northumberland County and uh, actually uh, Alderville Haldeman. A township uh, about 16 miles north of Coburg and uh, on the south side of Rice Lake our people originally were situated at the Bay of Quiddy and uh, are 
our community was uh, relocated to Alderville in 1835. And, and um, so we've been here for quite a long time. And um, originally a 2000 acre block of land and over uh, the ensuing 80 years, we added uh, additional lands that helped us get back on the water uh, at Rice Lake. And how many people are you? We are uh, closing in on 1,400 people on and off reserve. And again, we've had an exhaustive list of responsibilities that you all have. What would you like to add that uh, belongs on your list? Well, uh, education is a high priority. It always has been, actually. And we fund on and off reserve um, students. Um, Post-secondary education is a huge priority for us. We're able to, through our own internal resources, able to fund all of our post-secondary applicants. And so that is a huge benefit. Um, roads, infrastructure, um, by lawmaking and lawmaking is a huge priority and a frustration for us uh, internally here as we have uh, been dealing with over the last two and a half years. Um, as tele telecommunications, you name it, there's a lot happening here. Um, we are on a, a very busy highway, Highway 45 that runs from Coburg up through to uh, Highway Number 7. And so there are a lot of people traveling through here and uh, economic development is also a main driver in the community. Gotcha. And one last one for you. And I'm really not trying to be a smart aleck when I ask this question, Chief Moet, but I notice your headdress looks a little different from Chief Miracles. What's the story there? Uh, this is my blues hat, actually. Uh, I'm a musician, uh, so that's my blues hat today. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, that makes perfect sense to me. All right, thanks for that background, everybody. And now let's start to get into this. Uh, Chief Miracle, let's start with you. Um, we have heard through the course of those opening moments that you all have responsibilities for a lot of different aspects of life in your particular First Nation. And I guess I want to start, Chief Miracle, with what you see as the number one challenge facing your community today. What do you think it is? The number one challenge, I think, is to, uh, to create affordable housing for a large population, uh, along with the basic infrastructure of good roads and, and uh, safe drinking water. Uh, and also to create uh, economic development for prosperity in our community. Okay, that's interesting. So I said one major challenge, and, and you, you listed five. So it's really, <laughs> it's difficult to say it's one thing because it's everything. Is that right? Well, you, you need all these things. You need safe drinking water to have good housing. So the two are intertwined. And I guess the shortfall in funding is so significant right across Canada and primarily in the Ontario region. Uh, you know, the Ontario region still has 23 First Nations communities that are on oil water advisories of the 34. Um, Ontario historically has not received its fair share of the funding to address that. And so there's a very large backlog both in housing and uh, the need for uh, safe drinking water in the, in the Ontario region of, of Indigenous Services Canada. Uh, the Ontario region has about 25 percent of the, uh, the 900,000 uh, First Nation citizens. Uh, they have about 25% on reserve and off reserve, and so we don't see the corresponding investment in the Ontario region. And uh, that, that's uh, the formula for distribution within the I ISC should be reformed to reflect the population. Hmm. I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, for that four shot back that you just had up, Sheldon, because I want to ask everybody at the same time whether or not, thank you, there it is, could I see a show of hands here as to who has potable water on their First Nation reserve? Who has potable water? We have some, but not everybody does. Some, but not everybody. Stacy LaForme says he does. So, okay, Chief Carr, you don't have potable water on your reserve? We do not. We are working on this right now. And what we will have when the project is complete is same as Tyendinaga. Not all of our citizens, not all of their homes will be uh, hooked up to potable water. So what are you doing right now for people, I mean, for their, for their basic water needs? How are you handling it? Uh, right now, most people will buy bottled water for their home. And in our um, part of what's coming in is the, we're doing a water project. So we do have a line that will come down Hiawatha line. However, it will miss houses along uh, the other roads that we have in the community. So I believe about 40 homes will 
be online and then um, the rest will, they still purchase, many still purchase safe drinking water or they may have put in their own systems into their home. And what about uh, just sort of daily bathing and washing, that kind of thing? How does that work? Well, they they would most likely use their, their water for that. It's more about the drinking of that water. You'd be unable to drink it. Okay, so the water's good enough to bathe in, but not good enough to drink. Is that right? Correct. Got it. Okay. Uh, Chief Moat, how about to you? You didn't put your hand up? You don't have potable water where you are? Uh, we have uh, we have some houses, very minimal number of houses that are on a point of entry system in, in which uh, they are able to drink that. It uses a UV system. Uh, but they're, like I say, it's a minimal number uh, on the reserve. All of us are on wells. Some wells are better than others. And a lot of people uh, drink uh, bottled water. Um, we are working on a communal well that will allow us to have potable water in the event of an emergency, uh, but this is a little ways off yet. So it's sort of a hodgepodge here. Uh, again, uh, Alderville First Nation is quite dissected. We have the West Reserve, we have the East Reserve, we have the Main Reserve, we have Vimy Ridge, the, the small community at Vimy Ridge. We'll never see communal water here in the same way that you might in a small town. And so our, chan our, our challenges are, are quite, uh, um, uh, you know, quite uh, all over the map, if you will. I, I know you must have asked yourself this question a thousand times, but let me make it a thousand and one. How is it possible in Canada in 2022, you still don't have access, everybody still doesn't have access to drinkable water? Well, uh, I look to the uh, to the government, to the federal government. Uh, there's other files that are coming to roost now, in which our people have been uh, on the lesser end of uh, uh, of uh, funding. For instance, um, uh, there's been uh, child welfare, for instance, um, water, drinking water. There's a number of areas and a number of files in which uh, First Nations people have had to strive to get to an equal level uh, that other Canadians benefit mm. from. Chief Laform, how is it that you do have it? Uh, we've only had it for a couple of years, and, it, and it's it takes a lot of hard work and negotiation to, you know, get the funding to put on, put those water lines in because they're not cheap. Um, and we get, we get our waters now from the lake, uh, and when we hook the, the completion of our reserve, in the boundary roads where we touch on the Six Nations Reserve. Mm -hmm. And so we offered, you know, if they wanted to hook into the water lines as well, they, they could and most did. And um, we're hoping that, that that can become something that goes right across their territory as well, if, if they're so inclined. And you say you get the water from the lake. You mean Lake Ontario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for, yeah it comes through Haldeman, agreement with Haldeman, sorry. Okay. And, and uh, again, t you, you've had it for two years. How is yeah. it possible you only have had drinkable water for two years? I think the um, the um, fact that um, the government of Canada has allowed itself to um, look the other way in a lot of issues, um, dealing with the things that are on their table now and the Indigenous issues have been left at the back burner for so long that now that they're starting to look at those and address those, it's like, well, we got to do that, but we still got to do this. You know, I'm not making excuses for them, but I feel like uh, it's something that's been left on the back burner so long and now they're trying to work on it and they're realizing that there is so much to do. Do you have people, though, when the water treatment facility breaks down, know how to fix it? Uh, ours is solely supplied through water lines from Haldeman, so we don't have actually have people that work there, so we're depending on them to understand the, the process. Got it. And, yeah. when, and when they have problems, how high a priority are you to get those problems fixed? Oh, I'll, believe me, I'll be a priority. <laughs> I believe it. Okay, okay. very good. <laughs> Um, okay, I mean, water is something that's been an irritant uh, for First Nations in this country for just ages and ages, but um, Chief Miracle, maybe you could help us with this. Is there something right now that you're really proud of that's working? What's a social service or what's a, a public service that either you and or the Government of Canada together are providing and it's actually working? Well, the, the AFN uh, Chiefs Committee on Housing and Infrastructure have uh, have you know been lobbying uh, the government for increased investments in in, um, in housing and infrastructure. There have been some uh, increases in the investment. Uh, the three million three billion dollar investment uh, in housing that was part of Budget 2022 is certainly welcome. 
but it, it is very seriously short uh, to meet the, the overall need of $40 billion that's required nationally uh, to uh, address the housing issues. Uh, $4.4 billion is needed for the Ontario region alone just to catch up on the backlog of need in, in the region. Um, there's also a forecast of $16 billion up to the year 2040. Um, the federal government plans to uh, table by, by February of next year uh, a report, an, an investment plan to address housing and infrastructure, and so consultation is going on now with the First Nations. Um, by June 30th, uh, they have engagement sessions with the uh, infrastructure people in the communities uh, to give some kind of eight-year forecast on what the needs of housing and infrastructure will be. Chief Merkel, we're definitely getting the picture here. That's a long list for sure. I would like to get into, move our conversation along to have some discussion about elected versus hereditary chiefs. And Chief Carr, I'll get you in here first on this because I gather you are from yourself a long line of chiefs in your family and community, but you yourself are elected. And I wonder how your community sort of judges the difference between those who are elected and those who inherit the job. Help us understand that. We've been in the elected process since the Indian Act, since the agent came to our community. So prior to that, it was all hereditary chiefs and it was the Potash family, which is my mother's side of the family. So my great great and my great grandfather and, um, were the elected, or sorry, the hereditary chiefs. And then once the, uh, the um, Indian Act process started, then we had several of the Cowie family who were chiefs, including my dad, who had, was our elected chief for 18 years. And the community is right at this point, they are used to the elected process. That's the process that we use. But on the other hand, we're also learning, relearning, I should say, uh, the Mississauga Nation. And we're relearning who we are and how we governed traditionally. And that's a process too that will also take time. But at this moment, the elected process is the one our community knows and the one that we use. And you have been using, as you suggested, for uh, more than 100 years. Uh, chief yes. Laform, how about you? How did you become chief? Um, two of us ran for the spot and they disliked me a little less <laughs> than they disliked the other guy. So you got elected, okay. Yes. How does your community see the difference between hereditary and elected? So, so from my, uh, my, my First Nation, we've had the elected system in place or a form of it before the Indian Act actually came to be in place. Um, as you know, this being this far south and dealing with, you know, major, uh, major, um, Canadians, well, I'll say Canadians, but you know, it could be British loyalists that are Canadians. Um, we were immersed in that culture and that sort of thing, and we took on uh, an elective process on our own under our leadership, and it's been the same since. Certainly, we're we're striving now to reclaim some of those traditions that we had in the past as the Mississauga Nation and come together and you know look at how we should be doing things and respecting our past, hmm. keeping in mind where we are today. Now, I remember when Kathleen Wynne was the premier and she used to say, we're gathered here today on the traditional territories, the Mississaugas of the new credit. And I introduced you as the Mississaugas of just the credit. Yeah. What happened to the new? <laughs> we got old. Now, the, the, <laughs> we, uh, we were when we were located near the, near the water, we were called, the, and there's a long story behind it, Stephen, I don't have, we don't have time. But we became known as the Good Credit Indians, and the, and the water became known as the Credit River. When we left there and went to this new location, forced to, um, somebody thought, well, we're a new spot, we should be the new credit. So that's how it came. And then the elders go, this is no way to keep your name. Take that off of there. So we said, you're right, and we took it off. So the new is gone. The new is gone. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Chief Mowat, I want to find out a bit about your background. And to that end, I want to ask you about your great-grandfather, who I have heard was a marathoner. Is that right? That's right. And uh, he participated in some Olympics a long time ago? Yeah, his name was Fred Simpson. He was born in 1878 here in Alderville First Nation. Uh, he was a farm laborer. He uh, married his beautiful wife, Susan Muskrat, from Hiawatha, where he lived. Uh, he moved over there around 1899. And him and Susan raised their, uh, their children over there. But in 1906, just out of the blue, he was urged by some friends to enter into the Peterborough Examiner Road Race. 
And so he did. And he uh, he finished third in that race, but he was, uh, you know, the standout visible minority, of course, at that time. And he was taken under his uh, wing, uh, under the wing of uh, Dick Baker, the trainer of the YMCA Harriers Club. And, uh, and so within a year and a half, Dick had taken him to the Hamilton Herald Road Race in 1907, in which he placed second. And the Hamilton Herald and the Boston Marathon were the two prominent long distance races on the continent at that time. And so this kind of put him in the limelight. And so between October 1907 and, and June of 1908, he had progressed to the point where he placed fourth in both the provincial and national trial in Toronto, and he won a berth on the 1908 uh, Canadian Olympic marathon team. And he traveled over to England, and him and Tom Longboat were, were the two Canadian Indigenous runners, and my great-grandfather placed sixth for Canada. Uh, unfortunately, Tom collapsed at 19 miles. And so it was my great grandfather that became my hero. And, uh, and he was his legacy is what I grew up with. And I became his biographer. And I still, I still look, uh, you know, to him as a, as an icon and, and a very important pioneer in early Canadian amateur sport. Did he live long enough for you to know him? Unfortunately, no, my mother knew him well, she grew up with him, but he died, he died in 1945. Ah. Tell us about your thoughts on this uh, inherited versus uh, elected position of power. Well, our uh, our community uh, has been uh, they've taken in the uh, electoral system of the Indian Act since the uh, after post eighteen seventy six after the first Indian Act came down, and our people have been using that system uh, since that time, and and so it it is a flawed, very flawed electoral system. Uh, but uh, as far as hereditary goes, there's real no evidence that I've ever seen that there was a strong hereditary system here amongst our people. Um, there were chiefs that were voted in because of their knowledge or their prowess. John Sunday was uh, a long-standing chief of the community, but he was also a, an ordained Methodist minister. So. Because of the time, he fit the perfect, he fit the colonial bill, if you will. He was a, a, a strong spokesman and he believed in um, Methodism. He was a converted Methodist. Um, but there is no real evidence that the hereditary chief process ever took root here, not in Alderville. Uh, and my thoughts about it are that we are now pursuing other means uh, through either the uh, um, the uh, First Nations Election Act and or a custom code. And that is one of the other ways that we will get out from the current Indian Act two-year mandate that we're under right now. We've got just a couple of minutes left here. And uh, I guess, Chief Laform, I want to ask you about something that is in the news a lot right now and ask you whether or not, I guess, we can talk about it, which is, you know, the... Um, the first female head of the Assembly of First Nations is in some difficulty these days. She having been suspended by the organization, uh, she would say she's trying to root out corruption uh, that she has encountered on the job. They say she has not respected an internal investigation that is going on into all of that. And so we have a problem. Mm. Um, where do you see all this? Yeah, I, I don't want to get too involved in that because uh, I don't have all the facts as yet, right? And it's hard to form a position when you don't have all the information before you. I will say, though, that when you're dealing with people who always, both sides think they're right, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. So that's all I've got to say on that one. Okay. Yeah. Chief Carr, maybe, I mean, you're a female leader. Ruth Ann Archibald, uh, Roseanne Archibald, excuse me, is a, um, a female leader as well. I wonder, um, you know, do you have any views on this you'd care to share? My views would be uh, similar to uh, Chief Laform, and that is we don't have enough facts from, we've heard two sides of the story, and we don't have enough facts to have a fulsome uh, opinion on it, or we need that discussion. We need to have that discussion because the AFN is an advocacy body for the First Nations across Canada. And when there's internal conflict, I think it's important to gather all the information and then make an informed decision. Well, that's what I'm wondering about, Chief Miracle. Are you concerned that the 
attendant publicity around all of this is going to adversely affect either your standing in the eyes of Canadians or cause difficulty for you in negotiating with the federal government on the myriad issues you have to deal with? Well, I don't think so because the, the, the usually the chief and councils are, are um, negotiating directly with the government about the needs of their communities, but on policy questions, the uh, the it's very very important that the uh, the AFN have the confidence of the people they represent and also the confidence of the government that they're seeking funding for for funding from and for policy change or legislative change, and so I think it's very important to have unity and cooperation and. Uh, Good relations among the, the regional chiefs. Um, I'm not going to comment at all on the, uh, the, 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 the 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 current issue with the national chief. I, I like the others do not feel we have enough information, and it's my understanding that the regional chief Glenn Hare will be calling a, a meeting of the chiefs this Friday. And so we need to wait to hear what's said. There is a management committee at the AFN, which I understand that the Ontario regional chief is part of. Uh, that makes these decisions, and so we need more information about the uh, the whole affair before we. we and, and it really isn't our place to comment on it. It's up to the uh, to the executive of the AFN. Understood. I want to thank all four of you for spending so much time with us here on TVO's um, agenda for this National Indigenous Peoples Day. I hope it has been a good one for all four of you, and we thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll Miigwech. 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 Mama P. Mama P. Yeah, we'll go. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. Tomorrow, a very special broadcast. We'll bring you the conversation we had earlier this month in downtown Toronto with five former premiers of Ontario about elections, democracy, and civic engagement in this province. It's part of a new series made possible by the Wilson Foundation. It's called TVO Today Live. And it's just the first of several to come. We hope you can tune in for that and maybe even join us in person in the months ahead. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.